uh, Manuel, uh, who's going to uh, be presenting uh, about Let Technology Evolve um, with uh, Altered Space. So Manuel, whenever you're ready. Hello, everybody. How is everybody? Good? I hope good. Yes. Nice. OK, my name is Manuel Gutierrez Novello. And I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, the evolution. Uh, we have seen very interesting overviews of the evolution of, of augmented reality, virtual reality. Uh, you will be able to go with me with a couple of interesting facts over the time. So um, tell me, who remembers the 3D view master? Yes, yes, that's what I'm talking about. Great. Well, the interesting thing is that's exactly how it all started for me. You can picture me, you know, in Mexico back in 1979 watching this flipper uh, television show. And at the same time, my grandparents, they gave me this flipper reel for the 3D View Master. And I was looking at the 3D View Master and I was looking at flipper on the television and I was like, why does it look so different? I mean, this, this looks amazing, you know, when you look through the 3D View Master. It looked, like Flipper was right here, you know, the drops, the water, everything was there. In the television, well, it didn't look quite the same. So I asked my parents, and they read the brochure, and they're like, oh, because it's 3D, you know, you have two perspectives. And I was like so engaged with the idea. I was like, well, somebody should be doing 3D for the home. This will be amazing to have at home, right? So. That's how it all started. I, I've always been like a geek, uh, you know, working with computers since very early stage. Uh, the Apple IIe, you know, making first program software, you know, uh, compiling with Debase and stuff like that. In the 1986, I was 16 years old. I was, I was already working with uh, databases and programming and automating schools and my companies, uh, so many companies from my friends uh, when I was 16 years old. So it, it was interesting, you know, growing up with the technology around. Um, pushing the fast forward button, okay, uh, three companies later and a bachelor of science and engineering degree later, uh, I was talking to my wife and I was like, hey, uh, all this time and absolutely nobody has come with a solution for 3D to the home. I know this, this is doable. I can have 3D to the home. So why is it that nobody's doing it, right? But it has to be, you know, back in the 2000s, everything was analog. There was not even like a high definition enforcement or something like that. It was like all analog, VHS, you know, DVDs. So I was like, no, 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 it has to be digital. We have to be able to take this to the best resolution as possible. No loss in quality and color. 3D was there, you know, 3D was a lot of red, blue, you know, anaglyph, uh, you know, some shutter glasses at 30 frames per second. Some of the NVIDIA drivers were hacked for doing that, you know, and, and, and projectors. But nothing that could really take 3D to the home in a very decent manner. And also, I thought it had to be compatible. There couldn't be any way that you create something that is not compatible. It's like going from black and white to color and not keeping the compatibility. And, and finally, I thought I, I needed to emulate the way that your eyes and my eyes work to have a comfortable experience. So um, I realized that there was nothing and that an entire infrastructure had to be created. So in 2003, I found the T Division. I filed uh, many patents all over the world, uh, filing for the compression algorithm required to encode the stereoscopic images, the left and the right pairs. You know, and then I realized by experimenting and doing some tests that there was a lot of redundancy between the left and the right. So I came up with the motion vectors between the views, and then I called that the delta. And then I said, well, wait, I can deploy the 2D version, one of the eyes, and then use the delta or the difference to be encoded in like an enhancement layer. And then I can put it there and I can deploy it. So I went ahead, uh, there were no cameras, there were no 3D displays, there was nothing in the infrastructure back in, in that year. So I created my own camera, high definition, I, I created my own encoder, my own decoder running on the computer, and um, I created some virtual, uh, virtual reality games, some augmented reality uh, platforms. And I ended up creating my, my own head-mounted display. Nothing in the market was actually like, you know, making justice to full high definition. So um, I created the concept of encoding once, deploying everywhere. Um, I submitted my patent statements to the ISO back in 2007. And I said, well, if somebody, you know, ever in the future uh, is willing to do 3D, this, this could help. I joined some of the ISO and PEG organizations. Um, and then I started to create these prototypes and demonstrating the prototypes 
from the you know from the acquisition point of, of 3D all the way to deployment and delivery and visualization. Um, I went to the whole you know uh, road and pony show uh, where we were showing the demonstrations for for this entire ecosystem 2006, 2007, 2008. You know there was nobody talking about 3D like like in a commercial manner, like really really like in a feasible way. Uh, but we were there, and I see a lot of uh, very well-known faces that met me back in 2005 and 6, and, and during those shows, it's very glad to you know it's, it's very nice to see you around again in this in this stage of technology. So when we were presenting, many companies started to contact us. Companies like Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, they saw head-mounted display. They saw the cameras, they saw the displays. So we started working with them. We actually started selling the prototype of the head-mounted display to the military. Northrop Grumman was using that for several projects, and, and some organizations were using that for training purposes. It was until 2009 and 2010 that the Blu-ray Disc Association announced the official spec for their Blu-ray 3D initiative. And it happens to be the same initiative where we are listed in the standards since 2006 and 2007, 8, and so on and so forth. So uh, we are still celebrating on that. <laughs> and um, the, the, you, you just started to see a lot of three-dimensional Blu-ray uh, uh, players in the market, cameras as well, uh, some PlayStation 3 firmware updates that were pushed. We were actually the first company to show uh, all these things before they actually went to the market. So it was very nice to see this kind of progression of the industry. So clearly, and simultaneously, many other initiatives uh, came, came by, you know, uh, artificial, uh, I'm sorry, augmented reality and virtual reality. It, it all started to evolve around the world. It, clearly, we're not the only company. There were many companies on that. Um, we went through the whole process uh, together, View6, Imagine, all these companies that were doing great products as well. Augmented reality also started to evolve simultaneously. We started to see, a, you know, from the heads-up display from the uh, jet fighters going all the way to very nice cool applications in your iPhone in, you know, in the latest years. Great displays, augmented reality displays, you know, the Epson, Moverio, all that. Um, and we see that robots are also evolving um, quite interestingly. Okay, so what happens with this? Um, when you look at, at a general overview of the current situation of technology on these different fuel, fields like augmented reality, virtual reality, robotics, and, and others, uh, we can find a lot of challenges. That's why the whole community of enthusiasts of augmented reality is here. We're trying to solve those challenges. Um, you know, the, the gestures, interfaces, the infrastructure, there has to be an architecture. By experience, there has to be uh, standards. They have to be developed. They have to be adopted. They have to be pushed. And then the whole community is going to develop something harmonized. Um, all those challenges need to be addressed. Um, so we're, we're blurring a line now. We're crossing a line where, where what used to be science, what used to be fiction, uh, and now it's, it's you know, merging. Now science, uh, fiction is becoming science, and, and science looks like fiction. It's like, it's incredible. It's amazing what you can do with science today. So um, when you mix all these concepts, augmented reality, virtual reality, and uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, together, okay, we can see that the enabler has clearly seen the processing power, you know, the GPUs, the CPUs, the, the evolution of, of, of Moore's law, clearly it's, it's you know, making a great uh, demonstration of how this uh, platform is evolving. Now, what I want to tell you is that this looks like a collective evolution. If you look around the world, all the people from all over the world that is around here in this show, in this floor show, you know, you have people from everywhere. This collective evolution, technically speaking, is, it's it's evolving. It's creating new things out of the same knowledge. Different people from in different parts of the world, they all are getting this information. They are starting from one perspective. They see the same thing. We all see the same thing. We all see where this is going. And this is fantastic. That's why I call this the evolution. Let, let technology evolve. 
this technology, if we were to look at it as an organism, it's actually evolving. It's actually getting smarter. It's getting stronger. And where's all this collective evolution going? You know, where's all these trends going? Well, it's, uh, it's going to a very interesting place. It's going to new worlds. It's going to break and blur the lines between what is real and what is computer generated or digital. It's going uh, to create a new learning evolution for humans. We're going to be able to learn if we apply all this technology you know, for education, for medical applications. That's where the real evolution of the human species is. We're going to be able to you know, save. I was last night at the Meta uh, uh, party. It was amazing. And, and you know, they were just practicing and, and, and doing these things to a dummy, virtual dummy, and saving him, bringing it back to life. You know, it, it was a virtual dummy. But doctors can actually be trained to do that without really having a patient. So uh, this actually enables new tools to conquer new worlds. And we're talking about breaking frontiers. We're talking about using all this integration of initiatives, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality, and robotics to go to the next step. That's where we're going. That's where all this is actually pointing to. And that's why I say that we need to let technology evolve like an organism. And I invite you, everybody here, to be the factor of change and the catalyzers to make this happen with the effort of each one of you. So thank you very much. That's it. Awesome. OK, and so uh, do we have any questions from anyone? Oh, we have one. Awesome. Hey, how's it going? Good. Uh, thank you for the talk. I was really curious to see what your thought is on terms of what do you think will be the greatest, the, the largest uh, driver for improving a, the AR industry over the next few years? Okay, yes. In that case, uh, augmented reality has to be something that becomes part of your daily operation, just like a cell phone. It has to be comfortable, it has to be seamless, and it also has to be something that you use very naturally. So all these gesture applications, you know, all these interfaces that are going around, that they are getting better, acquiring the three-dimensional world, acquiring your, your, your location and position of your hands, all that is key for a, for a seamless interaction. I believe that augmented reality is going to be the accumulation of information once it's standardized, because it has to be standardized. You're going to be able to access the information that comes from every single credit card transaction that you make. So the system can tell you that three miles from here, there is a store that sells an item that you might be interested on, because you have a pattern of, of purchase. And, and that information has to be you know, there. You don't have to look for it. And that's where the artificial intelligence part comes. You have to be able to pull that information that is all scattered around the internet and make it intelligent, analyze it, get the correlations, get the covariance between all that information. And then that has to be pushed to the augmented reality world. When you get the information that is relevant in the palm of your hand in a seamless manner, that's when augmented reality is going to be you know, in the mainstream. That's my perspective. Yeah. OK? <laughs> awesome. So any other questions? Oh, this will make Mr. Ori very happy. We finished a little bit early. So um, big round of applause for all of our speakers. Thank you.